2023's The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds, and Snakes Review and Thoughts. Part of me really wants to refer to this movie by the abbreviation Tibosis, but I'll probably just be calling it Ballad. Yeah, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved. This video will get will have some jokes, none of the expense of members of minorities, and we'll get into some serious topics. And let's see, yeah, if you're looking for a review that's like, oh, it's different from the book, so it sucks. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. I will be talking about differences and... Overall, I did like the audiobook better, but that is very often the case, and I do think this is yet another very strong adaptation in this franchise. So, yes, I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review where I'm almost definitely not going to spoil anything for the movie itself. You know, if I decide to do so, I'm going to verbally let you know before I start the spoiler and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. But yeah, please note, I will not be warning before spoilers for earlier entries in this franchise. And as soon as I end the review itself, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for all four books, all five movies. And let's see. Yes, in including discussing the ending, and I yes, I'll also be, I already said that, never mind. Um, yes, so let's get right into, uh, right, yes, so I am a lifelong feminist, but I am an allosis het man as such. I've never lived as a woman, cis, or trans. I try to show empathy and listen to the lived experience of women. I am aware I have dead spots. As such, I might accidentally say something ignorant. So if any woman is bothered by something I say in one of my videos, please let me know. I'm open to editing that part out. If it's a case where the whole video is bad, taking it down. This movie is rated PG-13, like the others. The IMDb Parents Guide, is, uh, let's see, yeah, for, for sex and nudity, it says none. Violence and gore is moderate, so is frightening and intense scenes, but profanity and alcohol, drugs, and smoking are both mild. That makes a lot of sense to me, and this is definitely, this is the harshest of the, the movies when it comes to this more intense and, and violent material. And this has always been... It's too bad that they already made all the other movies. I'm, I'm not saying that it would be a wonderful idea now to make, you know, to adapt the first three books, but I do feel like we've gotten to the point where a PG-13, which is what they insist on for these, which, fair enough, a lot of the, the biggest fans are, like, teenagers. But at this point, the PG-13 has been pushed so far that it can... It's still not quite go as far as the books do, but it gets much closer. The violence hits harder, and yeah, I, you know, this is the, this is where it should be at at least, you know, the the others really struggle to to have as much of an impact because the violence is so toned down. You know, in, in these stories about teenagers forced to kill other teenagers, you know, it, there has to be a certain level of violence or it's just not going to make sense. You know, this isn't Barney. But the, the yeah, this one gets much closer and, you know, I, most of what I watch these days of the, of the current stuff, is like comic book movies and certainly in recent years the MCU and some also the DCEU have really pushed what the PG-13 can allow for you know you especially see some some of the ones that push the furthest is stuff like the third guardians of the galaxy movie black adam stuff like that and 
yeah, you know, if you felt like those were, this does isn't as intense as those two, but it gets, there are times where it gets fairly close. And the, let's see, that brings us to, right, yes, uh, I have watched this once, I literally just got back from the movie theater right before hitting record, and so, so it's very fresh in my mind, and... Yes, so the, the plot, I'm just going to quote some from Wikipedia here. Years before he would become the tyrannical president of Penem, 18-year-old Coriolanus Snow is the last hope for his fading lineage, a once proud family that has fallen from grace in a post-war capital. With the 10th annual Hunger Games fast approaching, the young Snow is alarmed when he is assigned to mentor Lucy Gray Baird, the female tribute from impoverished District 12. But after Lucy Gray commands all of... Penem's attention by defiantly singing during the reaping ceremony, Snow thinks he might be able to turn the odds in their favor. Uniting their insti instincts for showmanship and newfound political savvy, Snow and Lucy Gray's race against time to survive will ultimately reveal who is a songbird and who is a snake. And let's see. Right, so yes, um, it has been a minute since I talked about this franchise. I really loved, you know, just, yeah, it's, very, I'll, I'll be able to very, very quickly bring you up to, to speed about the, so basically, no, I was not aware of this franchise before I heard that the first movie was coming out. You know, I think I either, I think it was before I saw a trailer. But, you know, I, I heard, oh, there's going to be this new YA adaptation, you know, and it's a very, very popular book. And I was like, well, you know, I I fairly rarely go for these. I still haven't watched, for example, Twilight. I'd like to think that I wouldn't hate it. I, you know, Lindsay Ellis really ended up coming around on it, and I'd like to think that that's where I would land as well. You know, this thing of, okay, not the best thing ever, but there's, you know, the backlash was completely disproportionate. But, yeah, you know, I was like, eh, sure, I, uh, you know, maybe it'll be, maybe it'll be good. So I got the, the audiobook, listened through it, and was hooked from, like, line one. Like, immediately I was like, okay, this is amazing. You know, listened very attentively through it. And, yeah, really, really loved the, the movie as well. Got really hyped even just seeing the cast. I knew Jennifer Lawrence. You know, I, I've since come to realize, oh, right, she was in X-Men First Class. I just... I don't, it's, it's really not my favorite X-Men movie, but the thing I remember, the thing I knew her from at that time in, you know, 2012 was Winter's Bone, where I maintain she's amazing, you know, you can really see, uh, you know, a lot of raw talent there. Anyway, yeah, love the movie, uh, been doing the exact same thing for all of the sequels and this prequel. As soon as I heard that the movie's coming out, I get the audiobook, listen through it, and yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's wild to me that it's been eight years since Mockingjay Part Two came out. Um, yeah, as soon as I heard that they were making a prequel, I was like, thank goodness. I, you know, I, I don't know if this is gonna. Like, some people really love this movie, some people really hate it. I don't know if this is going to re reignite the, the franchise. It doesn't, to me, feel like a cash grab, but I can appreciate that some people feel that way. I'm not going to... Like, if you, if you say, you know, Citizen Kane is a terrible movie, we're going to have a discussion. That's not something I'm going to let stand... 
But if you tell me that you thought this movie was not worth, you know, that they should have just left it at the, the first three books and four movies, I can understand where you're coming from. I don't think that means that you're, like, just a hater or something. Now, let's see. Yes, so, um, yes, the handling of plot twists. I don't think there are too many plot twists, and I didn't personally think any of them were bad, and it's not one of those where, you know, oh, once you learn a certain twist, the movie just falls apart. One thing I will say, and this is sadly, this goes for all five movies, there's, for each of these, there's something really, really important that is not explained enough, you know, and it, yeah, it's, it's really, it's too bad. Um, I, I get it, you know, it's, the, it's difficult to fit the entire book into a single movie, and they didn't really want to do the, the split it into two thing again, since, you know, what if people don't really show up for the second half? It's been eight years, you know, not everybody is still super excited about this, this franchise. I gotta admit, when there was a, um, some more news episode... Uh, yeah, it's been a while now. It must have been a year ago at least. But, you know, he was like, oh, you know, back in 2015, I really thought that we'd be, you know, that we'd still care about Hunger Games years later. And I was like, oh, right, I guess not everyone does, do they? I, I still rewatch the movies every so often. Anyway, yeah. Um, there are times where there's too much time spent on a thing because it's important and then there are other times where they're kind of rushing through stuff because they only have so much time you know for so so yeah um this is a series that th these films have always struggled with that and yeah each of the films has at least one thing where it's like that could have gone better so this was written by hold on, there we go. Yeah, the the yes, the, the novel was once again written by Suzanne Collins and the screenplay was written by Michael Leslie and Michael Arndt. And it makes a lot of sense that Michael Arndt is is back because he also wrote the helped write the screenplay for Catching Fire the second I'm not 100% sure Michael Leslie I don't blame him for Assassin's Creed that was an uncrackable nut and you know I I can imagine he did a great job on Macbeth I'd, I'd really like to watch that movie. I gotta watch more Justin Curzel, because that, you know, there's a there's issues with Assassin's Creed, but Justin Curzel's direction does a lot with not much. But yeah, um, I think they do a, a good job of, of the, yeah, adapting you know it's it's again this thing of you know I, I i i'm so glad that these that the adaptations for the hunger games movies have consistently been written by people who read the original who understand the original and who want to do what they can to actually put on the screen the the pictures we saw in our heads when when we either listened to or read the the original book you know and yeah this one like the others you know there's certain things that they just kinda have to skip over there's certain things you know like the others this does not have a voiceover narration Th this one does not do 
something that the others did more than this one is we'll have scenes where the protagonist is not present, which never happens in the the four books. Just never happens. If something important happened while the protagonist was not present, there it's going to be explained to them and the the reader at the same time. You know, by someone who was present or heard it from someone else. This one doesn't really do that, but it does the thing where stuff that's just too important that you need in there, you know, where in the book it's inner monologue, here it's turned into dialogue. There's a little bit of that that's slightly awkward, where it's like, this is not how people talk, and, you know, which... Movies don't have to be realistic. I like to say that every piece of creative expression creates its own world, and I try to only ask that it be consistent with itself. But even so, there's a little bit of dialogue here where it's like, okay, you really just needed to get across this bit of information, and I get that. It's definitely important for the viewer to appreciate but it does also feel slightly awkward. The direction is yet again handled by Francis Lawrence, who has directed, you know, the, the literally the only of these that he did not direct was the very first one, and I am substantially more forgiving than many, perhaps most, when it comes to the the shaky cam of the first one but I definitely am glad that it's Francis Lawrence I don't think that it I don't hate the director from the the first I'll real quick um, his name is Gary Ross you know he also helped write the um, the, yeah, the screenplay for the adaptation of the of the first one. Um, that's right. It is actually it's the only of his movies that I've watched. Other oh right, he he wrote Dave, which I vaguely recall. He directed Pleasantville. I keep hearing. I would like to watch that movie. I just haven't. I don't think I have access to a copy right now. But yeah, you know. I think he makes some very, very good choices, but it does very much feel like the shaky cam, especially how intense it got in the action scenes, was basically that was the best idea they had for how to hide how violent it is. And then, you know, Francis Lawrence comes in and instead of shaky cam, it'll just imply or cut away or that kind of thing. And yeah, um... I, I really, f it, it, to me, feels like, you know, if, if you just thought me out, if I had been frozen for a decade, and I watched the entire Hunger Games series in a single sitting, I don't think I would have been able to pick up, oh, you know, it's been like eight years. It, does, it doesn't feel like Francis Lawrence had to, like get back into if if it doesn't feel like he missed a beat here and yeah uh i would definitely say you know the the hunger games both movies and books before this one i feel like each of them is better than the ones that came before it several women user reviewers talk about how hot they find snow which i guess makes him water or maybe even steam so, Snow was barely in the first book, and now he has his own book and movie, because he became so interesting in book two and three and the the films. That's something that I really appreciate. You know, when, when I first... I swear I'm not going to spend forever on this, but the first time I watched the the very first movie, you know, having only listened through the first book... I was like, why is this snow guy getting so much attention? Like, I don't I don't get it. He's barely in that first book. But then, you know, I listened through book two. I watched 
movie too and I was like okay I get it you know it's not just that they cast Donald Sutherland one of the best actors you know but no they, there's actually there's something really interesting with his character Concerning that book series author Suzanne Collins is a millionaire, I really appreciate that these books continue to be really sympathetic to those who are not rich. And before you say, well, of course, she's not, you know, of course she's going to write that. That's what's going to appeal to more readers. While I can only relate what I've heard others say about J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, Hateful Turf, she apparently has a lot of really hateful writing in her books when it comes to poor people. So, yeah, you know, really appreciate the that Suzanne Collins has not at all gone there. Now, so the, yeah, this one book and movie is in some ways similar to the Star Wars prequel trilogy. After a trilogy or quadrilogy that criticizes fascism, they go back in time by decades before the protagonist of the original was even born and shows how the famous, well, infamous, fascist lost his soul came to embrace fascism despite there being a chance that he wouldn't though where the titular star war in the original trilogy hasn't started in the prequels this one does start after the hunger games are already a thing but there's a lot of things about the games that are very different at this point fascism is one of the greatest threats to us today whether we're talking about the threat of death the threat of loss of civil rights the greatest threat of corrupting our inherent humanity and leading us to do monstrous things. So I'm really glad that there are movies like this that try to prevent its spread, even if the movie studios making them could do more good in the real world, treat their employees better. And... Let's see... Yeah, so the book is somewhat different from the first three. I saw a YouTube comment saying, oh, it's literally a different perspective. It's long-winded and self-indulgent, like Snow is. I agree with that. Some big fans of the original books do feel that it is simply too different. Now, let's see. So, yes, the... Um, Um, yes, so some, some quotes from Wikipedia about the, the, the book series. Major themes of the novels include distrust of authority of adults and the government, class discrimination and caste, resistance, the ethics of entertainment, most notably the origins and effects of war. Social inequality, unaccountable governance, and violence against children have also been suggested as prominent themes. In the world of the Hunger Games, the capital lives a life of extravagant wealth and consumption. Meanwhile, out in the districts, millions of people work dangerous jobs with low pay. As the capital wallows in excess, the districts can barely afford to feed their children. Author Suzanne Collins also mentions the themes of just war, gladiatorial combat, and hunger. War as a result of climate disaster and the power illusions of television have also been cited as themes. Others have mentioned revolution and rebellion as themes. Although it's aimed at young adults, it pre presents potentially quite subversive ideas of mass revolution, economic sabotage, and the populist fight against oligarchy. And let's see, so yeah, so the, the yeah, the story is set ten years after the war ended, and yeah, Cor Coriolanus Snow or Cory is eighteen years old. He's poor despite living in the capital, and he's desperate to avoid people realizing that he that the family is not rich anymore. See, and you know something that came across very strongly in the book, not as much in the the movie. You know, this does not mean that he does empathize with people who have always been poor. He just feels like well, we can't be poor. That's for those other people. You know, a lot of rich people cannot empathize with the poor, no matter what happens, and. That's part, part of why we need to tax them more. They're not going to do the right thing without, yeah, laws making, forcing them. And, yeah, Tigris, who, you know, 
you might remember. You know, she made a very strong impression on me in the in the book, but does not get very much time in the the movie. But she was actually Corey's cousin, and you know, yeah. If you've watched the other movies, you know she actually. You know, yeah, because he's so awful, he managed to turn her against him. And, yeah, that is something that happens with a lot of rich and powerful people. And, yeah, so some of the conditions of the games are much worse here. And reading the, or listening through the book, I get the sense that they change them because of the events here. Let's see, especially since Lucy Gray got so much attention and points it out. Other things are made safer for the capital, not the tributes. And you can tell how rich people change how they treat the poor, not because of empathy, but to keep them down. And let's see. Yeah, and you know, if nothing changes. Corey, the the Snow family will run out of money, and the, yeah, the the movie doesn't really explain this in great detail, but the the book explains there's this new tax being passed on rich people's property, and he and his family cannot afford that, and that's also in real life. Yeah, you know, oh, suddenly you care about this thing because you know most rich people have a very easy time paying property taxes and the yeah you know in in the book other than his grandmother the grandmam snow isn't cory isn't worried that the family is really going to to struggle or they're going to make it he's worried about the embarrassment and you know the first book's first chapter ends with katniss realizing her baby sister has been chosen to go to the gladiatorial games, this book's first chapter ends with Corey realizing he's going to mentor the girl from the 12th district. Very effective contrast between poor people problems fighting to survive and rich people problems worry then look bad. It's improper. And I th yes, that is what I will it's about the 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 yes so moving on um let's see um okay i'm just gonna speed run this i don't know if this i don't know if it still happens but years ago when you tried to talk about the hunger games movies you would frequently run into people who would dismiss the movie out of hand saying it's not the first to do the idea of high school age people forced to kill one another pointing out the truly excellent movie Battle Royale, which was released in the year 2000, a movie I rewatched for this review as well for the f as well uh, as the first four Hunger Games movies when they premiered, along with rewatching the four Hunger Games movies, and I have loved for as many years as I've known about it, since 2010. So yes, for those who care deeply about that, I had watched and did love Battle Royale before I watched the first Hunger Games movies or listened through the audiobooks for it. I 100% understand why some people prefer Battle Royale to the Hunger Games movies. I would never claim that it is inferior, less clever, had less compelling social commentary, and it is true that on the surface it, it appears to have the same concept. However, I really think it's doing a disservice to both properties, yes, including Battle Royale. While the core concept is the same, both properties have so much more to offer than teenagers killing teenagers. They're doing incredibly different things really, really well. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen some say that, uh, you know, the movie is basically just taking typical h Japanese high school students, giving them guns. The movie is saying this is the completely natural result of that. I 100% respect that reading. I'm, I'm sure... Th th um, this was from someone who actually knew the, the culture, which I am not going to claim that I do. What I've always read it as, though, and... Yeah, it's just to offer my interpretation. I see Battle Royale as 
essentially a criticism of capitalism. The kills and other situations of the movie usually have a real-world equivalent under capitalism. Under capitalism, we are not literally killing each other with weapons, but the dog-eat-dog -dog competitiveness does lead to a significant percentage of people dying long before their time. To an extent, Hunger Games also reflects high school, in this case, American high school, with the popular kids being the careers, various cliques, this person is in love with that person who's in love with that other person, and that and that, and in other ways, high school does feel like life or death while you're attending, maybe, hopefully, not as much years down the line. You know, there's criticism of class warfare. Hunger Games is in part about capitalism, the kills and other situations. Uh, yeah, yeah, same as with the... Uh, yeah, but Hunger Games has heavy focus on the modern media landscape. In addition to being a competition like in Battle Royale, the games are shown on television. People are encouraged to cheer on their favorite, though the odds are high you will probably favor one of the two from your own district. But then in real life, a lot of people cheer on the person they have the most in common. You know, you, you, what is that saying? You root for your home team or something like that. I'm not, I'm not into sports ball. You know, there are interviews. It is possible to positively impact one you like, though it is the rich who do that. But yeah, the real life equivalent would be something like voting on stuff in reality TV shows. The winner is expected to continue being in being, being in the lives of regular people via media. It also works as a criticism of sports under capitalism. Like, with social media, people get into fights over the games. The Hunger Games exist in part to punish the poor for being poor, something linked to their parents. In the Hunger Games universe, the punishment is on account of their ancestors fighting a war against the capital. To turn the poor against each other, to distract from the fact that the system is letting people suffer and die. You know, so... As I've hopefully illustrated, there are a lot of differences between Battle Royale and the Hunger Games franchise, and I per personally find the extreme relevance of the Hunger Games, which had the benefit of being made later, so was able to comment on things that have changed since Battle Royale came out, to be more appealing than the, the strength that Battle Royale has over the Hunger Games. The visceral violence, intensity, strong contrast between pre-battle innocence and the brutal, unrelenting nature of the battle see this movie ballad has gone back and forth between fresh and rotten day to day on rotten tomatoes as more critic reviews come in and yes so to briefly so some stuff i saw in various critic reviews uh, let's see yeah various people say it has too much singing i disagree but i see what they mean Actually, tell you what, that uh, I'm going to say a bunch of stuff that I read in reviews where it's like, I don't completely agree, but I see what they mean. So, uh, let's see, yeah, the singing happens at weird times. Uh, Rachel Zegler is not a good enough actress. Her accent is annoying, so is her singing. Uh, let's see... Uh, um, yeah, the the um, some people who read the book love the movie. Some people who read the book hate the movie. Uh, some people who didn't read it love it. Some people who didn't read it hate it. And let's see. Yeah, uh, apparently some people s say that Tom Blythe has no charisma. I really, yeah, I completely disagree. And let's see, yeah, and yeah, some some people say that the middle of the movie is bad. Some say the last third is bad, and feels yeah. I can I can definitely see what they mean with some people say the the thir the last third of the movie feels divorced from the first two thirds. And yeah, then we have some stuff that I do agree with. It's uneven, it's messy, sometimes too fast, sometimes too slow, too much material for one film. Right, some people say it's too long. I 100% understand, but I disagree. I It did not feel long to me. And, yeah, some people said that the sets, costumes, and props 
are slightly off. There's, there's, there's definitely something, yeah, something going on there. I, I, yeah, and uh, yeah, some people really did not like Zegler's facial acting. Let's see. Yeah, some people praise the retro futuristic vibe. Some say it should be 20 minutes shorter. Some say an entire hour should be cut out. I I can see an argument for maybe 10 minutes, but I would not. I I don't think it should be trimmed down in any. Now, let's see. Yeah, various people have said I didn't buy all the decisions made by major characters that changed everything. If I hadn't read, if I hadn't listened to the book, I would probably be saying the same thing. And I don't think that that is, I, I don't think that there's something wrong with reading a book and then watching the adaptation and there's something that's just there for you that other people aren't going to appreciate. I, I can completely appreciate that. I respect that. I don't think that you should have to read the book in order to understand the, the adaptation of the book. I, I do think that it's... I, I wish that a couple of things were at least a little different because for that. Some people say there's too little of the Hunger Games I'm not telling you that you're wrong for, like, expectations and, and such. I do wonder if... See, because I would say that if we're just talking, like, you know, watching tributes fight each other, if we're talking about time spent, screen time, where, like, there's tremendous, like, present danger for the protagonist or co-lead, I don't think that this is a huge, you know, yeah, it, I would argue that this delivers about as much as each of the individual the other ones. I do, it, it is true that, you know, as, as mentioned, Snow is basically the, the lead. And his situation is much less precarious than Katniss, Katniss's was in the in the three books and four movies. And it definitely is like the games, yeah, made up a bigger part of you know a bigger part of of Katniss's life was that, and yeah, if you I, I you know. It surprised me when I listened to the book. I was like, "Oh wow, we're actually this is this is not what I expected." But I, I kind of loved that, and you know, I obviously, if you go into this, you know, hoping for a huge presence of the games, you might be let down. But I would argue there's still like the the drama, the tension. The, the threat of, of death or, or injury is still there. It's just not from the, the competition, the, the Hunger Games themselves. But I 100% understand if you think it was too, too big of a change. You know, some people felt that way about book three, movies three and four. I, I personally, I don't, I wouldn't have minded if Catching Fire already was more different from the first one, you know, the way that Mockingjay and this are, but overall I, I really appreciate how the this this sort of ongoing reinvention of of what we're getting is and yeah some people felt the the movie has too much talking i can i can 100% appreciate that some people really love the third act structure some people really didn't and let's see 
yeah, some some people. One one person said the way women are portrayed in this movie is a shame. I'm not one hundred percent sure that I understand. I I think they might mean that it's like misogynist, which I definitely there there is some of that, but I don't really agree. Yeah, if you if you only watch the movie and you don't listen to the book, and again, I'm not saying you should have to, I can appreciate some things come across as somewhat misogynist because of the trimming down and some complex things not getting their, their full due. Uh, yeah, some people said the story is so relevant to stuff that's going on right now. Some people felt that made the movie better. Some people were just made sad by it. I, I thought it really worked. I, I've always appreciated for you know the the 10 years that this 11 I guess by now years that this movie series has been going I've always appreciated how relevant so much of this is but yeah this one is relevant in of yeah it it has some things that are just extremely relevant right now and it definitely is like if you're one of the people and I'm not saying this is wrong if you go to movies to be distracted from real life rather than as a way to try to process some of the some of the sometimes overwhelming sadness of real news stories and such this is not a movie for you but then i i feel like that should probably be clear at, at, by this point you know the this is a movie series that's from the start been you know very much taking these real tragedies and trying to process them trying to make it uh, yeah um and then we get some some very fun okay so so one person gave this an 8 out of 10 and said some people have said this film is woke but i really can't can't where they are getting from because there was no wokeness in this film which is definitely surprising for a 2023 movie I hate wokeness so if there was any wokeness in this film I would have given it a zero and another person said more woke garbage stomping all over the legacy of another great set of movies and I'm just like okay um, you're both wrong I am amazed at the idea that there is no wokeness in this film, or the idea, and, and as well as the idea that this was ever a non woke series. Like, my guy, from the start, this has been all about how you have these really appealing, you know kind people who fight hard just to make a living and then you have the the rich people who force them to kill each other for fun but that's not there's there's no progressive messaging there what that's that has absolutely no criticism of capitalism and just wow i just this is one of those cases where it's very clear that the word woke doesn't mean anything anymore, especially to the people who say that they don't like wokeness. Because if you don't think this movie is woke, or you don't think that the series has always been woke, you legitimately have no ability to recognize wokeness when you see it. it you know, I, I saw someone else basically say, you know, wokeness just means it's a thing I don't like. You know, there, there's no coherent definition. It's just, if they if they don't like something, they say it's woke. It's just, yeah. Um, and then, there, yeah, there was one person who said, Zegler really doesn't do enough here to justify going on strikes and complaining that she's not getting paid enough and simply deserves 
lifetime residuals. So it's fascinating to me that people keep zeroing in on the individual when these strikes, like, I swear, America, American culture melts people's brains. People are so obsessed with individualism that when they see an individual taking part in a larger strike, they zero in on the individual and say, well, I don't like that particular actor, so I don't think any of these people should be paid enough to do hard work that they can, you know, pay rent and eat food. Like, it's just, if you don't like the movies, you don't have to see them. You don't have to spend your own money to, to you know, don't pirate, obviously, but, yeah, you know, but that's not what this is. The strikes are not, like, you would think, for, for when you see conservatives whining about this, you would think that the strikers were, like, coming to their house and banging on the, the door and saying, you don't like what we make? We don't care. You have to pay us. No, that's not what it is. The strike is about getting part of the profit. If it makes a profit, not all of that money should go to the executives at the top who make most of the decisions that you hate. If you don't like various movies, a lot of the stuff you don't like comes from the executives. So just, like, if... It's just, it's fascinating to me. But, you know, maybe people will finally shut up about it now that, you know, thankfully, they, they the... You know, both sag after and the Writers Guild won their, their strikes, which is wonderful news. I, I am so happy for them. And, yeah, uh, one person said that they, they felt that the capital looked like Soviet Russia. And, you know, goes on to say something like, oh, you know, of course, the, the, you know, this is definitely, the, the capital would be like Soviet Russia. I mean, you're of course entitled to your own opinion, even when it's as wrong as, as this. I really don't think that the filmmakers were trying to make it look like the Soviet Union. I think they were going for a post-World War I Germany, since the original trilogy of books and trilogy of movies presents a fascist state, not a communist one, but, you know, at least they're engaging with it. That's something that I, I find it very frustrating when reviewers don't try to engage with it at all. And, you know what, engaging with it, even if I think you came away with a completely wrong conclusion, at least you engaged with it. That's wonderful. That's, that's so much of what I want from... Yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, so the opening scene of the film is very impactful and really, like, you're gonna know from right away if this is too much for you because some of the harshest stuff that happens in this movie happens in the first couple of minutes. I'm not gonna give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. Well, not enough for some people, but, you know. And I love the ending of the book. I wish that the ending of the movie landed just a little bit better, because it's, you can see, like, it comes so close, but I'll talk about that in the spoiler sections. And... As according to Google, and I have not really been misled by it, there was no post credit scene, so I, I left the theater as soon as the end credits started rolling. And let's see. Yeah, um, I believe I already mentioned, but just to make sure, you know, I definitely recommend reading, listening through the original work. This is one of those things... Yeah, whether we're talking about the book or the movie, this is a prequel that you can take in without any familiar any familiarity with the rest of. You know, I I could imagine that this movie might actually get a bunch of people 
who were not quite old enough, you know, eight years ago, now they're at an age where they can really get into this sort of thing. They watch this, and they're like, wow, there's four other movies, you know, that's, there you go, you can, you can binge them. And, yeah, I would definitely say, you know, if you've, if you've listened through or read the book, you know, I, I think there's a pretty good chance you're going to really get into this adaptation. And if you like the adaptation, I recommend the original. And, yeah, so the... I've already mentioned Tom Blythe Blip Blith Blythe doesn't say how you're supposed to pronounce it. Um but yeah, I thought he was good as Cory Corio. Um you know, you can tell that there's like mach machinate mach machinima machinations, machinations going on, you know, he's like trying to figure out what's the angle here, and yeah, you know, I'm not into dudes, but I, I can understand why some people were really, like, I saw one, one review <laughs> that said something like, he's too hot, you just, you have to stop, movie, please, you know, just, which, yeah, it's, um, yeah, for those who want to know, no, he, he does not always, he is not fully clothed throughout the entire movie. And, yeah, uh, Rachel Zegler plays Lucy Greybeard, and, I, th uh, let's see... Yeah, you know, she's a member of the, the Covey, a traveling musician group. So, you know, somewhat like Roma, kind of, you know. Rachel Zegler, I, this is only the second thing I see her in, which I think is fair enough because she hasn't been in a million things. The, yeah, this is only the third thing she is in. I have not watched West Side Story. Maybe I will at, at some point. The the thing I saw her in, which you know, if you if you're playing the home game, if you've been following along, you know the the process of elimination would would let you know the the other thing I saw her in was Shazam: Fear of the Gods, and yeah, she plays Anne in that. I knew from watching that that I would really that you know. I was really looking forward to seeing her in this. I thought that's you know she she's gonna be great as as Lucy Gray, and not just because she sings in you know, and she is an actual Rachel Zegler, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, she she sings in addition to to acting, but there's this like both characters, both Anne and Lucy Gray, have this sort of wisdom to them where they feel like they are, you know, they're, they're wise beyond their years, but the, the, where, where Anne feels like a, there's a sense of Anne basically being like a fundamentally good person, who's, you know, in a situation that she doesn't really love and trying to do the best. With Lucy Gray, there's actually this, like, for sure, she is, there is an element of her that is, that is a good person. But she's also got this, like, this bite to her. You, you can't, like, every, every so often she'll say something or do something, and there'll be a look in her eyes where you're like, I mean, she's used to, she doesn't normally, she's not usually part of regular society, you know, she wasn't, she was like on the outskirts of District 12 before the peacekeepers 
forced her and and the others into district 12 and yeah you know there is a there's an edge to her which i thought rachel zegler played you know fantastically like i've seen interviews she seems like just this this sweet and and warm kind person like if if <laughs> If during one of the interviews she like tried to to say something that was supposed to come off as as edgy, I would have probably been like, "That's that's cute. That's aren't aren't you precious?" You know. But as yeah, as soon as she inhabits a character, she really does just fantastic. Just yeah, and and yeah, I'm I'm aware of some people. Yeah, I, I think I've already made it pretty clear. I don't take conservatives' arguments particularly seriously. I, I take their threats seriously, which, you know, when they open their mouths, a threat comes out. But I don't take it very seriously that they're like, oh, you know, she's she's ungrateful. And just like, no, she just knows her worth. And that is something that a lot of misogynists cannot handle is a woman who does not just take the abuse lying down i'm aware that there are feminists and i'm not again i'm not trying to mansplain i i think it's important to keep in mind she's still young she is 22 years old you know let's let's all think back to our early 20s and be brutally honest I think all of us said some things that were kind of ignorant and that you know with a little age and, and more life experience we came to realize okay that's not you know I agree some of what she said about feminism is a tad naive she, she doesn't quite you know but I, I think she'll I think she'll get there, you know. And I I really think we have to, to be careful not to push people out of the movement that are a, a little over eager, which is really what she reads like. You know, tell you what, if in like five years, ten years, if she changed for the worse or hasn't changed much at all, I will one hundred percent say I was wrong. It's, you know, but right now it does feel like, you know, she can become a better feminist than, than she is right now. It's just, you know, we, we yeah, give, give her time, give her some, yeah. Um, let's see. Josh Andres Rivera plays Sejanus Plinth. A classmate and friend of Snow, and yeah, he, he mentors a tribute from District 2. He is originally from District 2, but now lives in the capital. And it, it is, they, they get a lot of great stuff out of the, the character, you know, slightly better in the book, but they did do a really, really solid job. You know, I, I read some reviews and I was like, ah, oh, they, they didn't get Janus right. I really do think they they got it mostly right. You know, it is this thing of he remembers what it was like being poor, you know, and he the the fact that he now has money has not made him forget what it was like being poor. You know, he's he's one of the good ones, one of the few rich people that yeah. Um Viola Davis plays Dr. Volumnia Gall, the head game maker of the 10th Hunger Games, the person who first implemented them. I can't say enough good about, like, I've, I've liked Viola Davis since, the, uh, you know, it's, I, I, I feel bad. I've actually not watched that many of the, like, uh, Suicide Squad was probably the first movie where I really, like, yeah, that was that was a movie that really had me focus, 
intently on her. She's amazing in that. You know, um, yeah, looking back, I have seen other stuff that she's in, but, uh, yeah, um, you know, and then, and, and Widows, she's just phenomenal. I am so glad that in this, like, she is very much just like, you know, she's proven herself. She's, she's won awards. She doesn't feel the need to play it safe anymore. And it is glorious. You know, she's, yeah, she's been making, yeah, she's been acting since like, 19, yeah, 1988. You know, she's, she's proven that she, Oh, holy crap, yeah, that's right. She's second cousins of Michael Mike Coulter, Luke Cage from Netflix. Anyway, yeah, um, Viola Davis just, like, essentially in this role, like, no one can really tell her no. And that goes for the, the character as well. So she's, yeah, she's kind of just, like, doing the things she feels is most fun. She's... She's basically a mad scientist, and it's glorious. And the the makeup and the costumes, and the, the you know she does such a fantastic delivery of lines that I already loved in the book. You know, just yeah, she's she's so much fun. Um, I would watch a spinoff that centered on her character. She's just she's so freaking good. Peter Dinklage plays Casca, Kaz, High Bottom, Dean of the Academy, intellectual author of The Hunger Games. And, yeah, I mean, I don't... Are, are you... Is, is anyone watching this video right now? Are you the one person who still needs to be told that Peter Dinklage is just an unbelievably talented actor... Uh, because there you go, there it is. He he is. I I I don't think I have actually have to tell anybody that. I'm I'm so glad that he's still. You know, I I was a little bit worried that this would feel like kind of just. You know, it's it's not the meatiest role. As you know, I I could understand. It would be frustrating, but I could understand if Dinklage was like, okay, uh, what, whatever, we'll, we'll do this. But no, he really sells it. Like, he's, he's so good. There's these fantastic, just, yeah. Again, some of these lines were in the original book and were amazing there. But to have him and, and the, the face acting and just, yeah, fantastic. Jason Schwartzman plays Lucretius Lucky Flickerman, the first television host for the 10th Hunger Games assumed ancestor to Caesar Flickerman, who hosts later editions of the games. I like Jason Schwartzman. I thought he knocked it out the park in the... Is that... No, it's not a spoiler in Across the Spider-Verse, where he plays the spot. I really, really loved him there. I thought he was good here. I really didn't think that, you know, I he got more chuckles out of, the, the character got more chuckles out of me in the book than, than here, and, and, you know, it's not really, it's not fair to... to Not very many people are as magnetic as Stanley Tucci. Um, it's not an insult to say that that that's not quite the the level, you know. And and to be clear, part of part of the thing with this character is that he's not. He's nowhere near as good at this as Caesar is. That's part of the fun of the character. And I do think that they... Yeah. They they do some, some great stuff with that. Um, 
yeah, I, I, I liked, I liked it better when they weren't trying to do the joke. I, I'm not gonna lie. The comedy in these, I, they're not quite my favorite thing. I, I don't vibe as much with Suzanne Collins humor in, in these books as as other people do which you know fair enough part of the, the the thing is that you know they're written for teenage girls I am not and never have been and never will be a teenage girl so you know but yeah um, but but definitely there's there's some really really effective moments with lucky. Hunter Schaefer from Euphoria, Jules from Euphoria, apparently, I haven't watched Euphoria, this is Wikipedia telling me this, but she plays Tigress Snow, and yeah, she's fantastic here. Um, she's one of the only people that knows pretty much everything that's going on with Corio. And, you know, yeah, they're, they're confidants. And, yeah, she's, she's really great. She es essentially, you know, part of, part of the reason she's there is to show it is possible for Corio to choose good. He has loving family who are encouraging him to, to do good, to choose good. So it could very easily be this kind of thankless role, but Hunter Schaefer makes a meal of it. Uh, really, really does. Yeah, fantastic. Finola Flanagan. I, I can't put into words how glad I am that she still is. Yeah. She, she's been acting since 1965. I'm so glad she's still around. Um, she doesn't have a huge amount of screen time, but she plays Grand Ma'am, the strict grandmother of Corio and Tigress, and yeah, even with very little screen time, she's just, she's so good. And I think that might be what... Yeah, um, one thing I thought was interesting, and this is, you know... Um, this is the case in the in the book as well as the the movie, but yeah, the the um, this actually has a um, hold on, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Yes, um, where the others are, you know, we we don't get to know the mentors in the other, yeah, in the Katniss stories, the only mentor we know is the, the, I can't believe I'm playing on his name, but yeah, the Woody Harrelson character, but here we actually do get to know of, of you know, at least a little bit about several of them, and... Yeah, and, you know, the District 12 female lead is actually a woman of color this time, not whitewashed in the film, though the book describes her as having some color to her skin. And Lucy Gray is a very different character from Katniss Everdeen, which I really appreciate. There's no reason to do another Katniss. As great of a character as she is, we had three books and four movies of her, and it is kind of this thing of, like, Katniss Everdeen, is great at survival but doesn't really know how to win over people and Lucy Gray it's kind of the exact opposite like yeah you know she knows some survival stuff but you know she's a she's normally a traveling musician you know Katniss hunts for food Lucy Gray plays music you know she, she she'll She'll live in, you know, in in cabins in nature, but, yeah, you know, but she knows how to work a crowd. She can really get people 
to to cheer for her. You know, that's what she does for a living. If if she can't put on a good show, she might not be able to make enough money to eat. So, you know, and where yeah, where Katniss had to learn how to be appealing to people, how to be media friendly, you know, yeah, Lucy Gray has to basically learn to to fight back and and yeah. I, I quite appreciate this, which also, you know, in the, yeah, with, with Katniss Everdeen, you know, it is this thing of, like, you know, she doesn't, she's a good older sister, she's, she's good at, at taking care of, of Prim, but she's not necessarily the best with other people than that you know, and, yeah, um, PETA gets her to come out of her shell some, where here, it's more this very friendly, cheery, you know, girl, you know, really, like, their gender, the fact that they're, they're from District 12, and that both of them sing on at least one occasion, that's pretty much all they have in common, you know. But, but yeah, um, you know, this can, I, I feel like this could help tell young women, you know, you can be a Katniss Everdeen, you can be a Lucy Gray, either way, you are good the way you are. Just, you know, figure out what you're passionate about and, and dive into that. You know, maybe you can be an amazing, you know, like, athlete, phys like, I don't know if we're trying to encourage young people to go out and, like, kill animals, unless they absolutely have to, to, to eat, but, you know, that can be your path, or you can be this travel, you know, yeah, this musician that, like, people come to, to see perform, you know, to listen to perform, you know, the, the, yeah, I, you know, a good part, a, that's a good way to do representation, to, to have very distinctly different, positive, you know, role models. And I think that about... Yeah, so the yeah, the cinematography is yet again strong like in the other movies. The cinematography was handled by Joe Willems. Let's see who has That's right. Yeah. Um Joe has he he's uh, sh shot all of the Francis Lawrence Hunger Games movies and some other he also they also did Red Sparrow together so yeah very clearly he delivers what I can't believe I'm blanking on his name I literally just said it Francis Francis Lawrence you know he delivers what he wants from him and yeah like the there's a it, it feels Like there's a there's a strong sense of 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 place. It feels like you know we're not just seeing sets, you know. And and it's oh cut together from a bunch of different places. It feels real, which is is a challenge for something where you know like in reality a lot of this is like sets that probably like exclusively built for this movie because it has such a distinct look and the editing was handled by Mark Yoshikawa who has also let's see right he didn't edit all of them but he did edit both parts of Mockingjay and yeah he also, there's a, a strong, and again, some things were, were 
trimmed down a little too much, although that might also be a screenplay issue. Some parts, you know, last a little bit too long, but I would definitely say they, they most of the time, it's really, really solid. And, yeah, the music is great. Uh, James Newton Howard composes again. And, yeah, he's actually, yeah, he, he, let's see, he produced the score for, uh, did he not also compose? Yes, and, and compose for, for all of these. And, yeah, he continues to really deliver. And, I think. I think that might about cover right. So the um, yes, we have the um, there we go. Yes, um, this was made on. A hundred million dollar budget. Let's see. Yeah, and and that absolutely shows. And then we have the. There we go. Yeah, uh, some of this was shot on location in Poland. Berlin and other parts of Germany. Yeah, and they they did a, a really great job location scouting. They they really found some places that capture this sort of you know we're we're recovering. It's been ten years since the war. We're not one hundred percent there yet, but you know it's also not just rubble everywhere. And, you know, it, it is very clear that this is a transition phase. You know, they're, they've, it's not that, that, like, buildings are literally collapsing around people, but it's also not anywhere near as polished as we see in the trilogy or quadrilogy, so it is very much this sense of, you know, I mean, we know, because we've seen the other ones, we know how it's going to end up, but it feels like there are opportunities, you know, it doesn't have to go that way, which of course makes it all the more tragic. And... Yeah, there's some really, really solid sound design. There are several times where tension is primarily through the, the sound. There's this, yeah, it's not a spoiler to say, there's this one point where, like, a major character is in a situation that seems like, okay, this could actually be dangerous, and we're like, you know, the characters are, like, looking around, okay, are we, is, is this safe right here? And before we see anything that is a clear indication of threat, we hear something that I don't... I don't want to give away exactly what, but just we hear it and immediately they're like, get out, get out now. And let's see. Yeah, and you know, for me and for others that the movie really worked for, it is legitimately emotional. Like, it really gets to you. And that brings us to the length. So, as mentioned, I, I walked out as soon as the end credits started rolling. That was after, yeah, two and a half hours of movie. You know, um, IMDb says two hours and 37 minutes. As far as I've, as far as I could tell, those seven minutes are end credits, and you don't have to sit through those. 
let's see. And and to me, it did not feel long. Like if I hadn't known how long it was, if I just sat down, didn't look at my watch, then you know, finished. You know, once I'd watched the entire thing, I would probably have guessed. My guess would have been half an hour off. I would have thought that it was, yeah, like two hours or so. But I acknowledge not everybody has had that experience. Some people felt it was way too long. So, the um, yes, that brings us to the, the best elements. You know, yeah, have getting more of the Hunger Games universe, the the performances, especially Zegler and Davis and and Inklage, you know the the way, yeah, the comment, the the social commentary, how relevant it is. Um. Yeah, this is the part where I try to force myself to say something negative. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think they could have done a better job. I don't know if I can point to something and say, oh, that's the worst. I don't... I I kind of love... I, I love this movie too much to say worst about it, which I realize makes it sound like I love it more than all the movies that I have said worse about but I definitely the 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 ending and in general some some pacing issues were probably what yeah what I wish was different the most uh, yeah before I got into this I was a little worried that it would try to like that that it would be overly deferential to rich people, you know, but no, it is just as biting as this series has always been. What I was most looking forward to was more Rachel Zegler and Francis Lawrence, and yeah, absolutely exceeded my expectations. You know, I, I want to make it clear, I don't think that everyone who dislikes Zegler is doing so out of misogyny or for political reasons or such. But I do think that the the choices she makes are largely the the right ones and on the rare occasion that it's wrong it really does not strike me as oh she's just not a good actress as much as you know, this is literally the third thing she's done. You know, give her a little bit more. You know, there's room to grow. And again, I really don't. Th there, there were very few times where I felt like, okay, that was maybe not the best decision. The trailers do give too much away, but it's very difficult to sell this kind of thing without spoiling anything. And I would definitely say it gives you a good idea. Both of the trailers give you a good idea of what the movie is like. But but yeah, if you you know if you've watched the first trailer but not the second one, try not to watch the second trailer until watching the movie because it really does give way too much away. As you know, movie trailers these days, yeah. Uh, the cover and poster don't give too much away and do give you a pretty decent idea of what the movie is like and on Rotten Tomatoes this has a 62 percent so it is currently fresh yesterday it was rotten the day before that it was fresh so on and so forth there are now 173 reviews and 107 of them are fresh the average score is 6.20 out of 10 it has a 91% from audiences, based on more than 500 verified ones, an average rating is of 4.5 out of 5. So, you know, it's definitely, there's, yeah, a lot of people who've watched this so far, you know, yeah, really, really loved it. 
The consensus, an outstanding cast and exciting story helped make The Hunger Games, The Battle of Songbirds and Snakes, a worthy return to Pan Am in spite of a rushed and somewhat frustrating ending. On Metacritic, it has a 53 out of 100 mix or average based on 47 critic reviews and yeah so 47 percent positive 36 percent mixed 17 percent negative and let's see um, Yeah, so several people say that it just, yeah, it's too, um, yeah, you know, yeah, one, one direct quote, the time to end the games came long ago. And, right, one person says the contestants just lack dimension. There's some truth to that. That is something that has been true of all of these. I actually think a lot of... I, I really, really cared deeply about several of the, the contestants here. You know, I, I feel like Francis Lawrence has just gotten better and better at very quickly humanizing them. And the script is also really great. You know, getting better and better. Now, users gave it an overall score of 5.2 out of 10 on, on Metacritic, mixed or average, 51% positive, 40% negative, 10% uh, uh, mixed. And let's see. Um. Yeah, several people just dislike Zegler. You know, some of them say that they don't think she can act. And let's see. Yeah, one person, I'm not even sure if they dislike the acting or they just don't like, like, stuff she said in interviews, which, like, I mean... Your child to your opinion, but I th I've never I will never understand giving a negative review to something because you don't like the an an actor in it. Like I mean, other than you know, if it's like Mel Gibson or or someone who actually spread hatred, but I don't know. I haven't seen every single interview with Rachel Zegler, but. As far as, you know, I haven't heard any... I know she 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 definitely hurt some people's fifis because she, like, criticized some of the romances in, like, animated Disney classics. And it's like, I mean... Yeah, The Prince from Cinderella is kind of... A I, I literally... I just rewatched that movie just, like, I don't know, a week ago or two by this point. She's Rachel Zegler is kind of right. Like by today's standards, the way he acts is like a stalker. You know, I it just when the movie was originally made, that was considered romantic, but today it's considered abusive. So she's really just reflecting, the, you know. And I didn't watch. I, I don't think I watched everything she said on Cinderella, but it seemed to me. Like, she was basically just saying, the movies we're making today have to reflect values of today. I'd, I don't know. Maybe she did say that, oh, you know, those movies were always terrible. That just wasn't really the vibe I got. But, you know, I, I definitely do. And, and again, that's a, that's a young person thing. I, you know, when I, back when I was young, I say, even though I'm not even 40 yet, yeah, sometimes I would say things where it's like, okay, but 
perspective, though, you know, please get one. Now, the yes, so on IMDb, it has a 7.2 out of 10 based on 14,000 user ratings. 24.6 gave it 8, 22.9 gave it 7, 14.9 gave it 10, 12.5 gave it 9, 10.2 gave it 6, 5.8 gave it 1. Holy crap. So yeah, um, people who don't like Rachel Zegler realized that they could vote on this. I, I, I really don't understand giving this a 1 unless you just hate her. Anyway, um... Like, there's nothing, there's not a single thing in this entire movie that you thought would get it to above a one. This is, like, this review bombing crap is just ridiculous. It just means that people can't trust these sites anymore. See, what there needs to be on stuff like IMDb is a thing where someone can just put, you know, amount of, like... Everyone who just hates Rachel Zegler and doesn't want her career to take off, just, like, you know, click on this thing once each. And people who do, are who only care about, oh, I really hate Rachel Zegler too, I wonder how many other people, you know, they, oh, look, there it is, you know, because, yeah, as it is, now it's, it's basically impossible to, to trust. Anyway... 4.3% gave it 5, 2.1 gave it 4, 1.3 gave it 2, and another 1.3 gave it 3. And, yeah. Um, so, so the movie has definitely found its audience already. And there are currently 189 IMDb user reviews, or 140, if you don't count spoiler ones and I read uh, let's see yeah I, I read the top 100 of the ones that did not have spoilers so, yes so the special effects there's definitely there's some stuff that's absolutely amazing uh, some very photorealistic CG and, and some really great practical effects as well. And then there are some where you can kind of tell, I, in my opinion, it was never distracting with, with the visual effects and such. But, yeah, you know, if you, if it's very important to you that everything is photorealistic, there is a little bit, but not very much in this that yeah there's some really excellent stunts and <clears throat> yeah um i rate this eight pre fascist rise prequels out of 10 and Yeah, um, so I said earlier, you know, Hunger Games, both movies and books before this, each one is better than the ones that came before it. And yeah, that, that includes this one. This is, in my opinion, the best of the, of the series, both book and movie. And I do not say that lightly. And yes, I did watch the other ones recently. And I still love all of those as well. And that brings us to the spoiler section. So from here on out, I will be spoiling everything about this movie and book. So only watch on if you are okay with having all of it spoiled. Starting with notes taken while watching. So yeah, we we open in the the war three years before the start of the the Hunger Games, and yeah, 
the these two cousins, both orphans, looking for food, and there's this um, what's it called? This dog that's got like rabies scaring them, and they witness like someone about to engage in cannibalism to you know survive and yeah like right away you can tell okay this is really taking it to an another level this is incredibly intense and you know ultimately the like the cannibalism is still implied but the implication hits harder than a lot of the implications in the other films you know just yeah you can really understand I, I think it was the exact right way to open the movie because every single time we see snow with the choreo make a decision where we're like wow that's really heartless you know yeah because on some level he is still that scared little orphan fighting to to get something to eat witnessing cannibalism you know so th th this doesn't mean that what he's doing isn't evil but it means that he can't really or won't really imagine a better world and that is you know I I don't blame people who struggle to to find hope but I don't want those people to be president. You know, if you don't think that the world can be changed for the better, you should not have a tremendous amount of political power because you're not going to use it right. You know, so the yeah, it's really it it conveys very strongly why he is such a you know, monstrous fascist leader. Let's see. And yeah, one of the first things we, we hear is that his father died in a rebel trap in the forest of District 12, which, like, right away, you know, yeah. So there at the end of the movie, when he's considering, you know, living in the woods. It's it's this thing of, you know, it killed this is what killed his father. You know, this is Yeah, so just very very nicely done and I have to admit I I reading my notes again, I kind of thought that there would be like tonal whiplash, but I guess so, like somehow not really, despite the fact that the next thing we see is like 18 year old Corio in his underwear, then taking a shower. And it's like, there's a lot of movies where there's like a shower scene that's like male gaze, you know, although I guess this is male gaze, why as gaze. So that, you know, that's perfectly fair. I, I, you know, if we're gonna, if we're gonna do this, let's have some equality to it. I will say there were, like, af after a little while, I did start to wonder, does he ever wear a shirt? You know, I'm, I'm not saying that I would have a problem with that. It's just that from some of the reviews I read, Apparently, some of the young women watching would find it extremely difficult to focus. That's all. And, yeah, Tigress is very charming. And, let's see. Yeah, and, and we see, you know, Corio is not heartless yet. You know, the um, Tigress is like, you, sh you should eat something today. You know, making it clear that's not doesn't happen every day you know have have a potato and you know he says no give it give it to grandmam you know that that is legitimately a, a sweet thing to do 
see. And yeah, they explain the financial woes dialogue where in the book it was internal monologue. And then we have the yeah, I I really loved the just from from right away, like Viola Davis's performance, just so much fun. And yeah, they told me you know people aren't watching. Uh, you know, some people are bored with the Hunger Games, which makes you wonder why we're making another movie. Let's see, and then we have the. Yeah, uh, Lucy Gray intro is a lot like the book, and yeah, the the singing just so badass, you know. The the thing about you know nothing, nothing you can take from me was ever worth keeping. Kiss my ass, you know. Just yeah, really love the the kind of you know it's. It's really hard not to, to get, you know, we want to see her succeed. She, you know, life kicks her down. The mayor literally kicks her down. And she's defiant. You know, she doesn't give up. And... Um... Yeah, the the I I appreciate the detail that one of the tributes like tries to stay on the train, like the peacekeepers have to fight to get her off the train. The I I really they they did a great job here getting across the the tragedy of these teenagers forced to to fight to the death. You know, They've done a, a good job in the other movies as well, but several of the the details here just really, really hit hard. Like, I, I'm terrible with with names, but the one that was like really young, you know, who's who seems like very naive and and trusting, you know, and she gets like overpowered by by the snakes near near the end of the games just you know really tears your heart out in, in a way that like we were already deeply invested in for example rue but to see you know yeah just really really powerful and yeah, so here in the movie, he manages, he, he slips onto the truck because the guards were dealing with a different, from what I recall, in the book, he does, he basically goes up to one of the guards and says, I want to go on, and the guard at first is like, no, you're not, you're, that's not going to happen, and then after a while, he's like, you know what, fine, your funeral, you know, go ahead. I do think it makes more sense like this, the, you know, yeah, him having to, to sneak past. Very tense confrontation in the, the truck. Good detail that, you know, um, Lucy Gray tries to talk them down without, like, seeming overly deferential, but she just points out, if you kill him, they're going to hurt your family back in the districts. Which is a very logical, you know, that's, yeah, she's probably right. And, yeah, he gets, you know, he, he didn't realize that he was going to be inside a zoo with all these people considered subhuman on camera, but, you know, she says, own it, and, yeah, he, he makes it work. And it is legitimate, like, I, even if you hate Rachel Zegler, 
if you can't find it adorable when she's like talking to the, these little kids, you know, and and like, you know, oh, I like your dress. You can touch my dress. You, I like your dress too. Uh, you know, you're four years old. I think that's a very smart age to be. Just she's so adorable, you know, and just yeah. And yeah, in in class they debate the the ethics. And yeah, they tell you know, yeah, talk about why the Hunger Games. And yeah, you know, they they talk about is it right to force kids to fight to the death? And yeah, um. I, I respect, let's see, I think her name was Clemencia, you know, for, for being like, oh, well, you know, I'm Corio's um, study, you know, class partner. We do all the, the class projects together, which I also, like, yeah, I, I, I can't claim that I've ever literally had... A teacher, you know, coerce me into being attacked by a snake because I lied about participation on homework. But I felt like that. Like there, there have been times, you know. So, so yeah, nicely done, Suzanne Collins, on on capturing that. You know, yeah, like as adults, we know that, you know. At least here in the West, the this is kind of I'm I'm not gonna I don't know enough about the rest of the world to say, but you know here in the West, yeah, by and large, you are not going to be st you know sticking your hand into a, a massive crate of of s snakes, you know. But if, you know if if you pretend to have have participated on a on a group project. But it can feel like that. And yeah, we have the detail about you know this the the other tribute from twelve was bitten by a bat, and uh, let's see if I can get the name. Jessup, yeah, and yeah, you know, over the course of it, yeah, it just, it gets increasingly worse, and just, yeah, really, really disturbing. They they did a really good job on that, and we get the detail about, you know, oh, the only reason that she was able to get any sleep was he stayed up all night keeping the bats off of her. I, I quite like Corio describing, um, let's see, what's the, uh, let's see, so it wasn't Clemencia, was it, ah, uh, crap, yeah, I, I, I forget which one it was, but one of the other, you know, one of his classmates, he describes as poison with perfect teeth. And, yeah, you know, she, the, yeah, poison with perfect teeth keeps, like, you know, seemingly reaching the, the, you know, um, yeah, re giving, Ar Arachne, I think was her name, you know, seemingly giving the, the, the um the bottle to the her her tribute, but then pulling it away and being like uh, 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 you know and in in the book they they draw it out a little more and you know but but yeah they very effective you know the 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 tribute gets the the bottle you know breaks it and stabs her in the in the throat with it and yeah you know that's the kind of thing that you wouldn't think you could get away with in a PG thirteen but 
We don't see um, all the all the blood pumping out. And you know, when when Koryu gets there, it just oh the the bottle's still there. You know, it does. There's not a, a huge amount of of blood. There's not the you know you don't hear the the kind of gargling noises that you would if in an R-rated thing. But yeah, they they still get that across. And yeah, you know, right after the the peacekeepers shoot the the tribute you know, as if it would have been impossible. You know, she wasn't posing a danger to anyone anymore, but, you know, they they don't see her as human, so they just, you know, th that's the kind of thing that you might do with, like, a wild animal, you know. And... Uh... Let's see. Yeah, and you know, Grandmam says, you know, Lucy Gray will use Corio, so he should use her. And yeah, you have the the girl saying, you know, I used to climb the you know my mom's factory or something, you know, something like that. And it's just I I in my opinion the the fact that these are child soldiers these these are teenagers being forced to to fight to the death has never hit as hard as it does in in this movie the the others did do great but here it just really yeah it's it's legitimately depressing to watch which it kind of should be, you know, this is not, this is a deeply upsetting idea, so, let's see, yeah, love seeing Dr. Goal in her lab, it's so creepy, I really, I, I'm sure Goal wasn't the biggest fan, but I would like to thank Corio for going up and, like, poking at the thing, just to show, no, 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 that's not, like, you know, that's not a dead thing in jar. No, no, it's alive. It can perceive the world around it. You know, just really so, so messed up, so horrifying. Let's see. Yeah, and there's an explosion at the top of the arena, and part of it collapses onto Corio. And some of them are shot attempting to escape. We learned it was a, a rebel bomb. And... Yeah, and yeah, he looks through the, the ruins of the arena and also prepares some, some rat poison. And, yeah, the two of them almost kiss through the, the bars. And we have the line, you know, we've, we all do things we're not proud of to survive. And, and Lucky says, smile, it's why we have teeth. Which just right there, holy crap, that is... Because, I mean, I guess it's possible that he just, he's making a bad joke or something, but I get the sense that he means that, that he doesn't appreciate, no, we have teeth to chew food, you know, the, but, but yeah, he, he thinks that the teeth are just for show, you know, he, he can't imagine a situation where you wouldn't be able to eat food if you didn't have good teeth. And yeah, so they they capture the that one you know tribute that that ran off. They managed to to escape, take advantage of the situation. You know, he didn't cause it, but you know, and yeah, they they string him up. And Lucky has the goal to say, "We'll sleep better with him off the streets," as if this isn't a situation entirely of their own making, like. He didn't do this horrible thing and 
you had to stop him. No, you put him in this situation. He tried to get out, and but but that's you know that's like verbatim. That's the kind of thing that you hear when a, a person of color is brutalized by the police. You'll have you know people in mainstream media be like, well. We'll sure sleep better now that you know this innocent person has been brutalized because we assume that if you're not white, you're inherently more dangerous. Just it's it's so disgusting, and I really appreciate. That. I, I forget if that's I, I'm not sure if that was the exact same wording in the book, but yeah, whether it's in both or just the movie, both movie and book or just movie, fantastic. I, I really appreciate. Because, again, this is the kind of thing, you know, you might have some young people who will watch these new, this who used to watch this news coverage and not really think much of it, and then they watch this and be like, holy crap, that's, but that's a person, though, I, you know, so, yeah. Love the the long take of the, the Hunger Games. I, I will say I'm glad that they didn't keep doing it forever because the, I, I think might be like a minute or so and I feel like they they push it exactly as far as it could go without getting awkward you know and then then we do start having edits in the and it is also you know yeah this is this is the fifth movie you have to bring something really compelling to it action-wise, in, in addition to the other elements, if people are still going to care. You know, you can't just present it the same way. And, yeah, she manages to get into the, the tunnel. Yeah, and, and Lucky is like, that was disgusting, and I apologize. And, you know, for a second there you think, oh, wow, he does have a soul. But then he makes it clear, no, 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 it was the, the vomiting that was disgusting. It's not the killing. You know, that's that's entertainment. You know, he was like, you, you shouldn't vomit while, was it something like, you, you should leave your seat before you vomit or something like that. I, yeah. And, yeah, you know, the, the one of the tributes climbs up. And, you know, the guy is saying, please, please, and, yeah, you know, it's, it's very, very clear that it is a mercy kill, and, and Lucky is like, who knows, maybe it was mer mercy, maybe it was murder, maybe, maybe she killed him just to win, because he can't imagine that these, you know, young people might have feelings, that they might have empathy for each other. He legitimately, it is beyond his comprehension. I love the part where he goes from, you know, he, he says multiple times he is the weatherman, you know. Weatherman and amateur magician, something like that, you know. He goes from talking about the weather to commenting on the, the Hunger Games like it's like it's nothing big and you know making the point to him it is nothing it's not his kids dying it's not you know that blood isn't going anywhere near him he's not in any danger so yeah you know why would he care in in his point of view and then we see like vultures literally flying in and start picking at the 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 corpse of at least one of them that wasn't subtle that was like hit you over the head obvious and i applaud it because clearly conservatives do not understand messages if they are not being hit over the head with which i only you know i i'm not saying real life violence i'm saying you know yeah obvious messaging and then lucky calls the the dinner place and moves his reservation and it's like yeah he he actually he was like i mean 
just, I thought it would be done by now. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be a little late. Uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I just, I got to wait for some kids to kill each other. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. And yeah, goal sends. Goal has the goal to send Corio into the arena to get Sejanus Plinth out. And mentions, you know, he could win you the prize. You know, it's just, it's such a great because, because yeah, you know, she might not do it for you know friendship, but for money. And and it is this thing, you know, he, he usually doesn't have to get his hands dirty for for money, but yeah, this might actually you know, here he might actually need to. Very, very tense uh, scene in the arena with the two mentors. I really such they did such a great job editing this, like he, he goes in, you know, how was it? Enjoy Enjoy the enjoy the show or something like that. You know the thing when when they cross over the thing, <clears throat> you know, and and yeah, the you know we see okay. There's there's one tribute to sleep. There's a tribute to sleep up there. And he goes over. He talks to to Sejanus, and then we see one of the tributes like move a little bit, and we see one like wake up and like look at them and it's clear like okay this is this is just a matter of time like they're just they're really just figuring out okay which angle do I attack and do I attack right now or does it make sense to wait a little bit you know just a few seconds longer you know and the the you know you just hear the audio you don't see the movement from right away just fantastic job And yeah, and you know he manages to to get out, and he does. You know he kills. I think the name was Bobbin, and you know the the other one says your songbird is next on the list. And yeah, Goal says you know you become you turn from prey to predator in the blink of an eye. And you know at first, Corio th thinks she's talking about the tributes. But no, she was referring to him, you know. And and near the end, she does say, "You passed all of my tests." This entire thing has been an experiment for her, you know. She legitimately no longer has any empathy. She just she she winds stuff up and sees how it ticks, and and this is fun for her. This is a game because she's not in any danger. She she is the danger. She she causes a lot of other people to die gruesome deaths. But you know, like the the one time where she seems legitimately upset is the 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 part where one of the yeah when when one of the one of the students one of the capital students dies. You know, then she's all like fire and brimstone. You know, that's the only time that she she clearly never feels any empathy for any of the uh, district people. Yeah, and the the bat had rabies and has spread it to. And yeah, his his skull cracks when he lands on on a rock, and that's again, you know, there there's something somewhat similar. You know, it's not the first cracked skull in these movies, but the audio really really sells it, and it also it shows just enough to really hit. And yeah, so the attack they they. They used to be intentional attack drones, and now they're only really useful as attack drones. As a, what? I'm sending water. I'm just. I'm really eager. I, I want her to have a lot of water. You know, is that is that is that such a crime? Is it is it wrong 
to to send a bunch of <laughs> yeah that was that was legitimately kind of yeah and yeah and you know um Lucy Gray puts rat poison in the one water bottle and empties all the other ones. Very tense fight uh, up on top of the of the thing. And despite the fact that, you know, there's there's so many you know of of the like there's the the pack. You know, the um yeah, several are, are you know you you figure oh it's going to be one of them they're going to you know want some water and they're going to drink the rat poison but no of course it ends up being dill poor little already you know he he calls her diseased dill just you know really really hurts to to see and you know, it is sadly true. There, there are a number of times where someone has intended to hurt someone with, for example, poison, and it hit someone else. You know, and yeah, and the yeah. So you know, goal. You know, it goes on on TV, and you know basically says they killed one of ours will kill all of theirs that that we can you know anyone who's in the um, arena will will die you know even though they you know you you've been killing this, keep in mind this is this is the tenth year so for nine years they've made sure to kill you know, let, let's go ahead and presume that there were survivors of those first nine years, though I'm not entirely sure that there were. But, yeah, that's 23 teenagers nine times. But that's not enough. She's still bloodthirsty. Let's see. Yeah, and um, he gets stitches and she goal explains the the jabber jays which are of course important for later wouldn't it be funny if it was candy and it's like please stop talking just oh no wasn't candy and yeah right you know Shortly before dying, the the leader of the the pack, Coral, says, "I can't have killed them all for nothing." And again, just really, really hits you hard. And let's see. Yeah, there's that thing about, you know, oh, the they're not attacking Lucy Gray because she's singing and someone says she can't sing forever. Which, you know, if you have to put that in the movie, I can understand why some reviewers maybe felt like, you know, maybe there's too much singing in this movie. I am not a music critic. I just, you know, I, I know what I like. I thought that Rachel Zegler did fantastic singing in this. She's got a great voice. I could spend the rest of my life listening to Rachel Zegler sing. And there was more than one occasion watching this movie that I thought that was what was going to happen. And, yeah, and they, they chant, get her out. And finally, Goal caves and lets her out. And yeah, great scene when High Bottom confronts Corio about the the cheating and this thing of you know the uh, let's see 
um, yeah, it was his father's initials on the 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 yeah uh, handkerchief, whatever the the piece of cloth there, and the the you know the rat poison in the case the the case for the rat that he used for rat poison was you know Corio's mother's. And High Bottom saw her powder her nose countless times with it. He'd know it anywhere, you know. Yeah, and, you know, the, yeah, once they're on the train, you know, Corio is like considering suicide, and Sejanus is like we're finally free you know he it's they're they're they legitimately see this because this is the same situation both of them are in the same situation but they see it completely differently yeah and so Lil is at the the hanging and you know, yeah, the the guy is is hanged, and he, you know, he yells, "Run, Lil!" And the, you know, the the audio, and we also we see just enough that, yeah, you know, it is legitimately a very like disturbing vision to to see this this young man, you know, hanged, and yeah, you know, the. They're good. She's arrested for knowing, for for knowing the guy who who was hanged. That's that's enough. You know. Even even if they mean that she knew him biblically, certainly it wasn't public as far as we know. And you know later on, um, Corio is like. You know, because I know, you know, he's he's talking to to Sejanus. He's like, because I know you, I'm going to be hung. And meanwhile, certain segment of the audience are probably like, well, I hope you are. And yeah, very cool. The 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 Lucy Gray performance, really, really great. And. You know, it is. I I liked in the book as well. I I'm glad they they kept that in with the thing with you know she gets the the bottles. You you know I don't drink. I stopped that when I was twelve. What? It's just to what was it like? Rinse my th throat or so, something like that. You know, just and a fight erupts in the club and. Yeah, she says, you know, it. I still have one foot in the arena. Let's see. Yeah, and and she says something like, "We could be free out there." And I forget who, but yeah, someone says, you know, they lost the war. They don't deserve our help. Yeah, I think it might be Corio talking to, to Sejanus. And yeah, at one point they they get in the, the water together. And so, yeah, and, and Corio and Lucy Gray debate right and wrong. And, you know, she points out trust is more important to her than even love. Which, you know, that is something, there, there are a number of, of women who feel that way. So I'm really glad that that's getting reflected in media, you know, so that people can, you know, yeah. The, the people who feel that way don't feel like they're alone in that. And that people who might, you know, be attracted to, to one of the women who feel that way can appreciate, no, that's that's how she feels about that. You know, and, and from there, you know, you make the decision, 
you know, am I willing to be vulnerable with her so that we can trust each other? And if not, maybe I should try to find someone who is more okay with me not being that vulnerable. And yeah, um, Corio is told, you'll never see anyone from 12 again. Which, you know, it, yeah, it's supposed to be like, you know, aren't, aren't you happy about this? And it's like, can I, can I just not, and, and, you know, the answer is, of course, no. And, yeah, we learn that Tigress and Grandmam were evicted, but, you know, Tigress clearly doesn't want Corio to be upset or to worry about them. Um, yeah, very tense uh, confrontation when Corio ends up shooting the the mayor's daughter, Mayfair, and let's see, yeah, the, the them going around looking for weapons looks like Gestapo or something, and. You know, yeah. Um, Corio records the confession, uh, you know, without Sejanus knowing. And yeah, Sejanus realizes he's about to be hanged and he cries out, Mom, help. And and we hear that repeated by the, the Jabber Jays. And it's just, it's horrific. Just, yeah, really. It, it was just as effective as it was in the in the book. Just fantastic work on that. And then we of course have the you know they actually do meet by the hanging tree. And yeah, um, Corio says he won't miss people. Lucy expresses believing in like natural goodness gracious and yeah it, it really is this thing of just you know ultimately they are not compatible from you know a, a values perspective and yeah you have the thing you know you said you killed three who's the third and yeah and he finds the the guns under the floorboards no more loose ends besides me but you wouldn't talk of course not and yeah you know she's suddenly in a great hurry to get out of there you know I thought you said that it was too early to, to dig out those roots. Well, things are changing all the time. It's still raining. I'm not made of sugar. But you are as sweet. And, yeah, you know, Corio pursues her, calls out, doesn't see her, and, you know, finds the, the cloth, lifts it, and there's a snake under there that, that bites her. And... I'm not going to claim I get it. I want to say I 100% understand. As far as I recall, in the book, he thinks to himself, she must be trying to kill me about Lucy after the snake bite, not the drink. I appreciate that they wanted to get that across. I, I I don't know if I really felt like it worked that he's shouting, Are you trying to kill me after everything I've done? Let's see. And, and yeah, he shoots her. And yeah, she, you know, her singing is echoed by the birds, and he shoots some of the birds. 
and then he gets to to the train and you know the the military guy is like well, what what about your your snake bite and he said it won't bother me any longer you know it'll stop bothering me long before i get to district 2 in the book we actually witness him seeing the doctor and saying, you know, give it to me straight, doc. How bad is it? And the doctor's like, oh, this is harmless. Like, it, it, it's, it hurt, obviously. I believe you that when you say that it was painful, but there's no danger from this bite. I get that they had to sacrifice stuff. I really wish that that had been clearer. I also don't know that like I don't think it came across as much in the movie as it should have it certainly came across very strongly in the book like in in the book straight up Lucy Gray says I know snakes you know when when you know I I know the kind of snake that's gonna hurt someone I know the kind of snake that's just gonna scare someone you know so this bit at the end when he thinks it's a dangerous snake but it turns out to have been harmless, it becomes clear afterwards that she actually specifically went out of her way not to hurt him. She just, she thought that he was going to kill her to, you know, no loose ends. And she tried to buy some time by attracting a snake that wasn't dangerous and luring him to, to get close to, you know, and and that really didn't come across strongly enough in in the film, I would say. And yeah, he's told, you know, you're not going to District Two. There's been a change of plan. And yeah, he goes to to Gaul, and just yeah, really really scary. You 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 know you realize yeah, this whole time, like Gaul has been politically grooming Corio. And just, yeah, it's, it's incredibly disturbing. You know, Dr. Goal is what conservatives think liberal college professors are, basically. And, yeah, you know, Sejanus' father will take care of Corio. And... Yeah, and she has, you know, one last time, what are the Hunger Games about? And he explains his philosophy and you know, says, I am the victor. And that is, you know, yeah, there are fascist leaders where when you look at, like, the kinds of things that they would do and say, it is clear, yeah, Winning was the only thing that mattered to them. The they didn't care about the people they hurt. And yeah, the last thing Tigris says to Corio is, "You look just like your father." And earlier in the movie, when he was talking about, you know, he he brings up his father. And, and she says, all I remember is that he always had hate in his eyes. So this at the end, that's not a compliment. She's saying, I, I tried, Corio, I really did, but you won't let me save you. You won't let me keep you from turning to evil. And... Then we have the, yeah, um, Corio and Casca talk one last time, and it culminates in he poisoned Casca, and yeah, really, really great scene. I I love the the kind of like just the power moves that that Corio, you know, he he finds him and. And Cask is like asleep, so he like was. It? I think he like picks up like a book of. No wait, yeah, he he takes the box of belongings and just throws it on the you know, 
hmm, you know, this is not like respectful behavior towards someone who has power over you and, you know, theoretically you should respect. And we, yeah, we get that little bit of backstory of, yeah, you know, technically Casca came up with the ideas for the, the idea for the games, but he wasn't intending to, you know, it was like a theoretical exercise. He was drunk, but Corio's father, you know, yeah, went and, and made it, made it law. You know, submitted it, it, it became law, and now the, you know, all these people have died. You know, this is the, the tenth time that 23 teenagers die. 230 people, and, you know, Casca's like, I was hoping that it would just fizzle out, and, you know, I tried to sabotage it as best I could, but no, it's going to keep going and going. There's going to be so much blood on my hands. And he's not, you know, a real-life conservative, so that bothers him. And, yeah, it's, it's really, really gripping. And this, I, I really appreciate it. I, it never occurred to me before this prequel that the person who came up with the idea would feel terrible about it, but... Yeah, that you know that fits with the overall. You know, it's it's not about you know here are the good people, here are the bad people. There's there are some that are pretty clearly evil in the in this franchise, but not everyone that you might think is evil is pure evil, and same for the ones who are good. And the let's see so i have some more notes about the book let's see so i'm just going to yes so the the final section notes taken before watching let's see Um, right, so yeah, in, in the book, you know, yeah, she tells the camera she hasn't eaten in three days, and the camera tries to go to other tributes for damage control, she gets in front of it, asks people to bring them food they can spare, making the camera guy nervous, and let's see. Yeah, uh, Corey's mother died in labor with his sister. He misses her more than he misses his dad. And... Let's see... Right, yeah, in, in the book, Corey hates Sejanus for not being grateful for his wealth. And yeah, and and um, Grandmam hates that Corey ate with Lucy Gray, saying, "Your dad used to say that the district people only drink water because it doesn't rain blood." Rich people demonize the poor in real life as well, and it's the kind of thing I I really appreciate that Collins created this thing that like it's evocative. But like most things that conservatives say these days in real life, it falls apart the moment you think about it for like a second. Like, but if they just want blood, why not kill animals for it? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Let's see. You know, yeah, like a lot of bigotry, it doesn't actually make logical sense. And... Let's see. Yeah, and, and, you know, they talk about the, the betting idea, and apparently they bet on dog fights. And, yeah, you know, we see Corio come up with the idea of betting on the games, which 
we know from the other, you know, from the Katniss Everdeen stories, that's a really big part of the the later games. And right. Early in the book, there is a discussion about the reason for the games that is a partial or direct quote from one of the movies. I think it's the first one that wasn't in that book. So this is a very direct tip of the hat Suzanne Collins has expressed before that she thought they did at least some really great work on the adaptations. You know, it's, it's that thing of, you know, if we're just punishing them, why not just line them up and execute them? It would be easier, you know, that discussion you know and and it's it's very clever because in the movie this is something that Cory that that snow says to the the i forget what his name is but the game maker the game yeah in in the first movie the one who ends up you know eating berries the the yeah you know and and in the in the book, yeah, I don't think they put it in the movie, which I can appreciate. The, that might have felt like a little bit too much, but in the book, the what what Snow eventually says in movie one was said to him by Doctor Gall. So you know, yeah, it's he memorized that and and said it again later to uh, and and he said it to others later and let's see right Corey has to ask Lucy great questions to fill out paperwork and she flirts with him when he gets to the question married status and the other mentors have no empathy for their tributes and yeah, Lucy Gray points out to Corey, it's too bad they had to meet like this. They both imagine him coming to one of her shows, humanizing her to him, as we also see in the... Let's see... In the, in the movie. Right, and yeah, in the, um, in the book, Arachne teases the tribute by holding out a sandwich... Uh, yeah, withdrawing it multiple times, making the audience laugh. Then she takes a bite from the sandwich. The tribute slits her throat. I think it makes a lot of sense, the, the change they made. Let's see. Um, yeah, and in the in the books, we some of the internal monologues make clear Snow hates working with others, considering himself above them. And, right, they, they show the, um, when they, in the, yeah, in the TV, uh, on the, on TV, they, in, in the book, they show the, the Arachne getting stabbed, or, or having a throat slit, that, that thing, without, you know, yeah, focusing on that specific thing, and showing that over and over, Instead of focusing on what led to it, which you know is sadly true of a lot of news coverage these days. Let's see. And yeah, and we get the, the yeah the part where Clemencia is bitten for lying about working on a paper for school, and Corio thinks to himself, if she died, he'd be in all kinds of trouble. Because that's, you know, that's the thing he thinks about. He doesn't think about, if she died, her parents would have lost their 18-year-old daughter. I, I think in the movie, she just kind of disappears at that point. In the, in the book, she does come back later. I was kind of expecting that to be in the movie. Let's see. Right, and yeah, Corey and the other students do assignments, essays that help shape the game, sending the message to YA audiences that their ideas matter, can shape the future. As is true, though, in real life, not quite this directly. And... Let's see... 
Um, let's see. Yeah, the president gives a speech blaming Arachne's death on districts, has had the corpse placed so all can look on it. All the other tributes are chained so they can't even stand. Corey tells Sejanus he'll be reported if he wastes a lot of food. Let's see. And um, let's see. yeah, Gaul says the war may never end. Perpetual war, very useful for fascists. And uh, yeah, Corey eventually says then they'll have to keep soldiers in the districts and use harsh punishments to keep them in line. Sounds like what America does to poor people, especially those of color. Let's see. Um, right, and yeah, in the in the book, Snow reflects on the the song she she sings, and he felt betrayed. He doesn't like that she had a life before him. Very controlling, jealous. Sadly, many straight women act that. Many straight men act that way around women. And let's see. Right, and and yeah. To Corey, war seems like a waste of resources. That's the problem. Sejanus so liked about the war that he was still living at home. What did you love about the war, Dr. Gall? I loved how it proved me right. And before they can ask how, the bell rings. Let's see. Yeah, so Janus's mother says in District 2 they put bread with the dead, food for where they're going. Corey judges it harshly, not out loud, not realizing that all cultures have specific burial rites. Many are based on what makes the living feel better. And let's see. Yeah, so Janus says his father tries to buy everything. And he wants to die in the arena to send a message. And yeah, and in, in both book and movie, you know, the the Corey beating a tribute to death starts as self-defense. Let's see. Right, and the, yeah, in when I went through the book, I, I described, you know, goal saying, you know, you, you went from prey to predator so quickly. I wrote that as Dr. Gall goes all Heath Joker. Everyone loses their minds. And let's see. Yeah, Corey blames the poor for their own plight, believing that the capital give them a lot of money to which Sejanus points out, the capital invests in industry. The people are left to fend for themselves. Very accurate, very relevant. Let's see. I've, I've heard real-life American conservatives say, we're giving all this money, so why aren't they, you know, it must be their fault that things aren't working out. Not looking at how that money is spent. Right, and the, yeah, um, there's a military officer in, in the book who, that hopes the mocking jays will die out in a general. Wait, did I call them jabber jays early? I, I am aware that jabber jays and mocking jays are not the same. Anyway, yeah, you know, the military officer hopes they'll die out in a generation, but we know from the original book and movie they're still alive 64 years later. Let's see, and um, yeah, something that I'm not certain I I'm not sure I really felt came across in the movie. Lucy got reaped because Billy was with 
uh, hold on, her name, Mayfair, and, yeah, Mayfair was jealous of Lucy, let's see, right, and, and Corey expresses he believes if not for laws, people would be killing each other like they do in the Hunger Games, and Lucy and Corey debate if the state gives something back or if it only takes... <clears throat> yeah, and ah, crap, I'm losing my voice, but I'm almost done. Too stubborn to quit. Yes, so yeah, near the end, Corey has to flee in order to escape the fascist state. <clears throat> he and Lucy in the wilderness. Let's see. <clears throat> yeah, uh, the yeah, he almost immediately hates life in the wilderness. Being at the mercy of nature, thinking to himself that it's because he's so excellent he can't stand being without civilization. If he were common, he would be fine. He still won't empathize with others. Let's see. And... Yeah, then the next part plays out roughly the same. Yeah, yeah, the doctor tells him there's no way that the snake would kill him. There's no venom. And hmm. let's see the yeah he loves being in the power position of power over the dean and the very ending is him poisoning the dean rat poison the first of many he poisons as we know from mocking jay and that is everything for this video I think I will shorten my wrap up because of the voice thing uh, let me know in the comments what was your favorite thing about this movie what is your favorite of the books or movies do you hope to see more in this franchise and if so how and yeah that is it for this one so yeah um let's see that yes catch you next time